Welcome to section two of neuroembryology. In this section, we'll be continuing from our previous discussion by focusing on posterior fossa malformations. Let's get started. In terms of posterior fossa malformations, there are three you should be familiar with. Chiari malformation type one, Chiari malformation type two, and Dandy Walker malformation. Now, now Chiari malformations are congenital conditions that are defined by anatomic anomalies of the cranial cervical junction. And this leads to downward displacement of cerebellar structures. Now there's some variation regarding exactly which structures get displaced, so there are different types of Chiari malformations. And there's actually four different types, but only the first two are important for board examination purposes. So let's first focus on type one. So Chiari type one is defined as having abnormally shaped cerebellar tonsils, which are displaced below the foramen magnum. This image shows the adult brain, and down here is the cerebellum. And if we take a cut of the cerebellum and get a sagittal perspective, we can end up getting an image like this. Now this image and the cerebellar structures are discussed in detail within the neurology physiology portion of this chapter. Right now, just focus on the inferior part right here. This is a cerebellar tonsil, and in Chiari type 1 malformations, one of the two tonsils will protrude through the foramen magnum. This image depicts the base of the skull with the posterior fossa back here. You can see the foramen magnum right here, and the cerebellum should be posterior to this edge. However, one of the tonsils will slide down and be inferior to the foramen magnum. Now the left image shows a normal MRI, and we're looking at a sagittal cut, and the skull normally curves down like this, and it creates this posterior fossa. And you can see the cerebellum right here, safely tucked away up above, sitting on that posterior fossa. However, on the right image, we can see Chiari type one malformations. And we can see a herniated cerebellum with that cerebellar tonsil. Now MRIs are often hard to interpret. So what I do when I'm thinking of this disease is just follow the curvature of the skull and imagine the posterior fossa moving down like this and create this imaginary line of what it should look like. But that's not really what we're seeing. Instead of the whole cerebellum being safely tucked up above that posterior fossa, we see the tonsil protruding down below. So that's a Chiari type one malformation. Now let's talk about the presentation of Chiari type one malformations. These usually are asymptomatic until adulthood, but when they do become problematic, they can cause numerous issues. For example, the cerebellar tonsils can compress the natural flow of cerebral spinal fluid and cause a non-communicating hydrocephalus. This will lead to increased intracranial pressure and even papilledema. Also, the blockage of normal CSF flow can irritate the meninges, which can cause the patient head and neck pain. Also, the cerebellar tonsil can actually compress anteriorly and cause brainstem compression. This can lead to cranial neuropathies. Now, compressing the brainstem can result in lots of cranial neuropathies, but the two main nerves you need to think about are cranial nerves 9 and 10, which will make you think of mainly problems speaking, swallowing, and breathing, because cranial nerve 9 is the glossopharyngeal nerve, and cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve. So again, think of problems speaking, swallowing, and breathing. Now, if part of the cerebellum is being compressed, then cerebellar dysfunction is quite possible. So the patient can have ataxia and nystagmus. And lastly, the spinal cord can also be affected. And this most often takes the form of syringomyelia. There are conflicting opinions on why Chiari malformations actually cause syringomyelia. But the important thing for you to know is that it can lead to syringomyelia. So you just need to be familiar with what this condition actually is. So let's dive into that now. A syringomyelia is a disorder characterized by a fluid-filled cavity of a cyst called a syrinx. And the syrinx can actually expand over time and actually compress fibers of the spinal thalamic tract. And the spinal thalamic tract is responsible for pain and temperature sensation. So in other words, syringomyelia can cause loss of pain and temperature sensation. Now this fluid-filled syrinx typically occurs between the C2 to T9 levels. But there can be quite a bit of variation on what exact dermatomes are impacted. But for the most part, you can safely assume a cape-like distribution of that pain and temperature loss. Now this photo should help you visualize the pattern of sensation loss in syringomyelia. As I mentioned, 
This is often described as a cape-like distribution. So on the anterior side, you can see it around here, and then it descends down like a cape. And as I mentioned before, the syrinx can actually occur anywhere between C2 and T9. But the most common place for this disorder is the cervical vertebrae. And you can actually see a syrinx right here. And also notice that you can see a Chiari type 1 malformation with that cerebellar tonsil protruding inferior to the foramen magnum. Now this image shows the spinal thalamic tract. You can see sensory information traveling from the extremities here to the brain up here. This tract is discussed in great detail in section two of neurophysiology. All you need to focus on here is this central canal. Now a syrinx is a large collection of CSF, so it causes this central canal to expand. And as it enlarges, it will compress anteriorly this nerve. So this pain and temperature sensation will not reach the brain as it should. And of course, the spinal thalamic tract is bilateral. So pain and temperature sensation from both sides will be impacted. And again, that results in a cape-like distribution. And the last important point to make about syringomyelia is that it commonly occurs with Chiari type 1, as we've mentioned, but also type 2 malformations. So let's jump into Chiari type 2 malformations now. Chiari type 2 malformations are defined as the herniation of both the vermis and the tonsils below the foramen magnum. So it has a very similar presentation to Chiari type 1. However, it's more likely to present earlier and with more severe symptoms. And you should be thinking specifically of the cranial neuropathies, more precisely, the breathing issues that can result from those neuropathies. Here is an image of a Chiari type 2 malformation on the right. As I mentioned before, interpreting MRIs is difficult, but if you can create an imaginary line of where the posterior fossa should be going, then you can see the defect rather easily. And in this case, you can see a considerable downward displacement. This is pretty severe. Compare that to Chiari type 1, where we have this posterior fossa, and only this tonsil is herniating down. So going back to Chiari type 2, with this severe downward displacement of the cerebellar tonsils and the vermis of the cerebellum, then you get more severe problems. And you should be thinking mainly of cranial neuropathies at this point. Again, cranial nerves 9 and 10, which would make you think of severe breathing abnormalities, such as apnea. Okay, the last detail is that Chiari type 2 malformations are very closely associated with myelomeningocils. In fact, the relationship is so close that almost all myelomeningocil patients have a Chiari type 2 malformation. Now this image was discussed in the previous video on neural tube defects. You can see the normal spine here, and then four neural tube defects. Down here in the middle, you can see myelomeningocil. Whenever you see or think of a myelomeningocil, think of Chiari type 2 malformations. Now their relationship isn't perfectly understood, but just remember that they're associated. So now that we've talked about Chiari 1 and 2 malformations, let's talk about the last one, Dandy Walker malformations. This also is a developmental anomaly, and the anomaly is defined by two parts. The fourth ventricle fails to close, and the cerebellar vermis fails to develop. The net result of these two problems is enlargement of the fourth ventricle, which ends up filling the posterior fossa, giving the patient hydrocephalus. On the left, we see a normal image, and on the right, we see Dandy Walker malformation. Here, the fourth ventricle failed to close, and so the CSF that should be contained within the fourth ventricle just fills this posterior fossa. And again, this is hydrocephalus. The last item to discuss is that Dandy Walker malformations are associated with many different conditions. Now, popular books you may read say that it's associated with spina bifida. While it's technically true, Dandy Walker malformations are actually associated with a whole host of abnormalities, including different chromosomal abnormalities, environmental exposures, and other sporadic organ defects, which include neural tube defects and spina bifida. So the point is that Dandy Walker has so many potential associations, and the associations are not close enough that you should commit any single one of them to memory. Just know this, if a patient has a Dandy Walker malformation, they are likely to have some other problem as well. A problem you can rarely predict. Now that we've covered the posterior fossa malformations, let's review with a question. A newborn girl does not make any effort to breathe immediately upon delivery. After respiratory intervention is implemented, imaging is performed. Results indicate a posterior fossa malformation and there is significant compression of the brainstem. The fourth ventricle appears to have developed and closed appropriately. Which posterior fossa malformation is most consistent with this presentation? So we know a few things. One, the posterior fossa malformation has led to compression of the brainstem, which has likely led to neuropathy of cranial nerve 10.
which is the vagus nerve. And you need the vagus nerve in order to initiate breathing, which is something that's not occurring in this patient who's apneic. There's no effort to breathe. And again, that's apnea. And if we have a posterior fossa malformation that's causing apnea, we can safely say that it's a severe malformation. So since there's no breathing, we can say this is severe. And since it's a newborn, it's also early onset. And this is most consistent with a Chiari type 2 malformation and possibly a Dandy Walker malformation. However, we know it's not Dandy Walker malformation because imaging indicates the fourth ventricle has developed and closed appropriately. So Dandy Walker is not likely. And we suspect that it's a Chiari type 2 malformation.